Okie dokie. A few weeks ago, we cranked the faucets to max, plugged the drains, and turned the bomb battlefield into the biggest pool on the block. And of course, by doing so, a lot of strange stuff happened. Taking a level we know and love and converting it into something that's similar, but with different characteristics, taps into a weird part of nostalgia. Now obviously, you hear me talk about nostalgia this and nostalgia that all the time on this channel. It's my jam, and I love the games from my childhood. But why do we as people find something like this so interesting? If you're someone who made crazy impressive mods, someone doing a simple mod like this is kind of strange. There's nothing really impressive about it from an execution stance, but I think there's something that needs to be understood. A level being flooded still retains a level as a whole. Changing one aspect of something and seeing how everything else is affected still allows us as viewers to compare our memories with this game's environment to the newly affected one. On the flip side, this nostalgia is completely lost when someone takes a game and mods a completely brand new experience from top to bottom. It's super super cool, don't get me wrong, but it's different because we don't share a whole lot of common ground with it. It gets rid of a great deal of our foundation for what we remember about the game. When the bomb battlefield was flooded, I had an absolute blast exploring it. It was like I could literally fly anywhere due to how high the water was. But what if we took that same concept and reversed it? There's many levels in Super Mario 64 that are water-based levels. So what if we took away all the water? Say, in an iconic level like Jolly Roger Bay. How would the level change exactly? Well, let's take a closer look. Jolly Roger Bay is pretty much my favorite level in Super Mario 64. The music is absolutely amazing, and the environment is just super interesting. Now, I did a whole nostalgic documentary about this level already, so I won't get too deep into the whole feels trip it brings about, but I will say that seeing this level completely devoid of water was one of the weirdest things I have ever experienced. Because without water, it's no longer about descending into the depths of where the giant eel lurks. It's now an extreme hazard that will break Mario's back if he falls on down. But let's rewind a bit and go back to the start of this level for a moment. There's definitely something important to note about water in this game. Back when I was messing around with Babam Battlefield, I had the ability to add and remove water as I pleased, while the game ran in real time. But the thing is, Babam Battlefield normally doesn't have any accessible water, so there weren't any competing water boundaries to deal with. When diving into Jolly Roger Bay, lowering the universal water of the level still doesn't get rid of the water actually in the bay itself. Surfaces of the water are still defined like at the top of the bay and in the underwater cave. Even with the water level lowered well beyond the out-of-bounds areas of the level, these water regions were still intact. So before even doing anything here, those need to be removed. With this out of the way though, we're free to drain the water from this deep pit and explore it to our heart's content. We actually need to set the water below 5200 units in order for there to be no water whatsoever, as this level is very, very deep. It's even deeper than the secret aquarium. Surprisingly, by about 400 to 600 units or so. And to me, that room always seemed massive. That's another weird area to explore without water too. There's just fish flooding everywhere and no way to reach the coins at the top. Upon entering Jolly Roger Bay for the first time, the level of course has this dark haze that I wish would come back. But with the water gone, we've zapped that away too. However, if you look out across the waterless bay, it does look like the water is still present, because everything that was underwater has a different tone to it. Even the walls of the bay have a clear dividing line where the water levels are different colors. It almost looks like everything has a thin layer of algae growing on it, giving it that bluish green hue. I won't lie and say that running around this level without water feels normal. It's absolutely weird. It was completely the opposite of everything I had experienced before. Adding water to other levels was cool, but I've always been able to reach the same places with moon jump codes before. But I've never had the opportunity to evaporate water until now. Running and jumping around all the slopes I used to only be able to swim against was pretty neat. It is definitely strange seeing the clams and underwater plants still swaying to and fro though. Clams are still able to damage you, and when you take damage, you fall onto your behind. Even if we jump onto a closed clam, we will still take damage. While we're blinking from previous damage, we can sit inside the clam though. Doing so prevents us from taking any more damage until the clam opens up again. It basically extends our invincibility frames until we are no longer inside the damage hitbox for the clam. And while we're down here, there's of course a very interesting treasure inside one of these clams. And that's the green shell. 
Now, normally in Super Mario 64, we encounter two types of green shells. Ones that come out of boxes, like in Shifting Sandland, or stolen shells from Koopa Troopa enemies, and then underwater green shells. These are not the same at all. Interacting with the former shells make Mario instantly start shell surfing on top of it. This is what happens anytime Mario encounters a spinning shell on land. If Mario encounters water with a land-based shell, he'll surf on the surface of the water. However, shells underwater are not the same. They don't spin, and they are dormant. When Mario touches them, nothing happens. He has to initiate a grab underwater to pick it up instead. When he does this, he holds onto the shell, and it moves while dragging him behind it. But what if we try to use an underwater shell while not underwater? Will it allow us to fly through the air? So we head to the clam it spawns inside of, and give it a grab. And we just pick it up. The thing is, when we are not in water, the shell functions like a cork box. Mario is capable of carrying it just like one. We can run and jump with it, but if we try to throw it or set it down, the shell will explode into dust the first frame it begins leaving our hand. If we pick up the shell on land and then jump into a pool of water, the shell doesn't function properly. It's basically a dud, and it doesn't propel us through the water like it normally should. Even throwing it underwater just makes it explode in our hands. So yeah, that's basically the differences between shells, and some that you can only experience if shells that are normally spawned underwater aren't spawned that way. Unless you dabble with object cloning, that is. But even then, most objects where you'd normally be able to clone a shell lack an actual object you can carry besides the shell itself. So even that is an impossible situation normally. Enough about shells though. Let's hop into the depths of the level now. Making our way to the bottom of the bay is really weird because it's basically one of the steepest slopes in the game without water. You can get some pretty hefty sliding speed off this ramp. Once we're down here though, we aren't getting back up through any normal means. The only way we can climb to the top again is by spamming the ground kick by holding down A and hitting B repeatedly while running up the wall. This prevents Mario from sliding on certain hills that aren't too steep. Under normal circumstances, this hill would be way too steep. But because it was underwater, it lacks a characteristic that makes it steep. It functions as a typical sliding hill, so we can spam kick our way up this nearly vertical wall because of that if we choose to. Exploring the sunken pirate ship reveals that the collision box for the ship and the actual 3D object we can see don't exactly line up. You can experience this underwater normally too, as when Mario is underwater, he never really gets close to the actual ground. He hovers just off it slightly and never touches it. This is why King Bomb slid to his watery doom in my previous video. Draining the water makes this much more obvious though, since Mario is now actually touching the ground, and we can see that he's floating in certain spots like where the ship goes into the seafloor. Our eel friend still resides in the boat despite there being no water here. And if we do spam kick our way up the giant hill after seeing him, we can catch him swimming around in thin air way above us. Honestly, this makes the eel twice as scary because it doesn't need any water to survive. It's basically a giant flying tube dragon. If we don't make the eel leave the ship, we can still get into the ship even with it sitting there. We just need to take damage from the eel and run through it while we are invincible and blinking. This puts us into the interior of the ship and we take further damage since the spawning height is tall enough for Mario to get hurt without water. The interior of the ship is about the same though, except the chests no longer have air bubbles. Draining the water does nothing because it doesn't exist, so technically we don't even need to do the chests. Popping back out to our eel buddy though, we can sit inside the mouth of the eel too if we are quick enough. Normally, when Mario takes damage underwater, he hit backwards and moves away from the thing that caused him damage. This prevents us from using our invincibility frames to go through what just hurt us. But since Mario just falls to the ground when there is no water, that's why we can get to the same location again faster than if we are underwater. So we can jump inside the eel's mouth and just sit there. Because we're in the hitbox, just like the clam from before, Mario will be invincible until we leave it. So we can sit here in the mouth of the beast for all of eternity if we wanted to. It's actually kind of creepy seeing Mario just sitting there behind the teeth of the eel. Childhood nightmare fuel to the max. Now, one of the things I found pretty odd about this stage in its non-flooded state is that the ship that's floating on the surface of the water is still floating there despite us removing the water. Now, understandably, the developers of course wouldn't have accounted for this. There would have been no reason for the ship to be programmed to react to the water surface at all. So even with the water here, the boat rocks back and forth as if there is water. If we decide to flood the level beyond its normal capacity, nothing about the ship changes either. It's simply underwater now as it rocks back and forth. I was thinking that perhaps the crate would stop sliding or change its pacing a bit, but nothing actually changed. 
The reason I thought this was because of the black cannonballs at a bomb battlefield that had the momentum changed the moment they touched the water. This crate isn't affected by this, but there is something in the level that is though. While the ship we're on isn't technically floating, there is a platform in this level that does float. It's over on the right side of the stage near where the pink bomb is. With no water in the area, the platform actually rests on the ground and clips through it on one side. But if we add water, this platform will float to any level we have the water set at. Even if we crank up the water height to well beyond the level itself, regardless of the height, the platform will follow it and just float off the surface. It actually provides a pretty neat view up here, as nothing else can be stood on once the water level eclipses the stage. Of course, we can delete ourselves from existence too by utilizing the cannon at the start. This is something I covered extensively in my previous video, so if you haven't watched my video on flooding the bomb battlefield, I highly recommend giving it a whirl. Beyond these things, everything else is pretty normal. Water levels don't affect the fallen pillars in the underwater cave, and if all the water is drained from the level, the jet stream in through the jet stream actually doesn't do anything at all. It is possible to reach the star at the end of the eel's tail, but getting over to the area in order to achieve it is a bit strange. This will be something I'll cover later on when I tackle the entire game as a whole with every level flooded, except for the water levels. But with this, Jolly Roger Bay becomes quite a strange place when its key element is removed from it. Definitely still the level I know and love, but the entire feeling is different. But that's all I got for today. So if you enjoyed this, consider dropping a like, and I'll see you all soon. Thanks for watching guys and gals, and until my next video, cheers.